Now we consider the remaining issues from real estate transactions. We'll focus principally on mortgages for a few minutes, and then we'll conclude by touching on where real property law and the law of wills and trusts are important for our consideration. So, with regard to mortgages, I think it's important to acknowledge that this material is highly tested. It's tested both on the multi-state and on the essays. And, as is the case with so much of the law, you'll learn it a lot better by engaging in guided practice. So, when we get to our hypotheticals on real property, you can count on doing some work on mortgages. And it will be easier to see the law as we, as we illustrate it through examining real parties. And the most important advice that I can give you with regard to examining mortgage issues is this. We have to be very aware of the relationship between the various parties. So here, it's often appropriate to draw out a little map of the various parties and their relationships to one another. The more attention we pay to the relationship between the parties and to the chronology of events dealing with transactions involving mortgages, the better equipped we're going to be for analyzing what issues are presented. Because the mortgage issues really have more to do with our skill at organizing our thinking than they have to do with remembering the law. Because the law of mortgages turns out to be pretty intuitively sensible and fundamentally reasonable. There's nothing very exotic about the law of mortgages. Basically, this is the part of the exam where we have to be aware of secured transactions. And so, earlier, we dealt with real estate contracts and we dealt with real estate deeds. Now here, we deal with real estate financing. And it's important for us to realize that contracts and deeds and financing really are intrinsically connected to one another. It's all part of the same basic act of buying and selling interests in land. But the reason why we need to, to separate them from one another is because that way it's really a question of dividing and conquering. The more we examine and tease apart the various threads that make up real estate transactions, the easier they are to understand. So here, a real estate mortgage is designed to give the lender a security interest in the real estate that is the subject matter of the loan. It's really that simple. Now, what makes it complicated is where we have multiple mortgages or, or where we have both the mortgagor and the mortgagee assigning their interests. But here, as I just finished indicating, what we really need to do is just keep track of the relationships between the parties. Doing that under time constraints is typically harder than remembering what the law is. So a threshold issue that can arise in the law of mortgages, one that is not heavily tested, is identifying the various types of security devices. Obviously, the most heavily tested area here will stipulate that we're dealing with a mortgage or perhaps a deed of trust. But it's also true sometimes that a land sales contract can also serve as a security document, as essentially a mortgage. An absolute deed, when it is conveyed between parties not with the intent to transfer a full ownership interest, but only with the intent to transfer a security interest, here again, we can go to the contract remedy of reformation. The true relationship between the parties will be respected, and we will fix any written documents that might give rise to some uh, confusion in that regard. So a deed that is absolute on its face, but was intended only to convey a security interest, is going to be subject to reformation. And we'll turn it into an equitable mortgage with that document being used to signify that. Also, installment sales contracts can themselves be deemed a mortgage by a court. And the reason why it matters, the reason why we care about whether or not a particular document qualifies as a mortgage is, and it might be no surprise to you, it's connected to remedies. Because a mortgagee, a person who has borrowed money, has got rights to redeem a defaulted mortgage. These are typically governed by state statute, but by and large, there is a fairly substantial period of time. It can be six months, it can be a year after a default, where the defaulting party has the right to cure. So oftentimes, it's the borrower who wants to characterize the transaction as a mortgage because the borrower then has greater opportunities 
to resolve the problem, to pay off the debt, and to retake possession of the real property. So remember that the right to redeem is central to these issues with regard to problems arising out of mortgages. Next we see that both the mortgagor and the mortgagee can transfer their interests. It's obviously much more common for the lender to transfer their interest. And the current events about the various bundling and collateralization and rendering uh, mortgages into collateralized debt instruments is uh, very ripe for political discussion. But I don't think you'll find it as terribly ripe for testing. Basically, what we're dealing with here is dealing with the distinction between being subject to a mortgage and assuming the mortgage. The rights of the parties can be quite different depending on the magic words that are present in the documents. Again, I counsel you to go out and practice. Don't study this stuff in a vacuum. There may be one multi-state question touching on this issue or maybe none at all. The bread and butter of mortgages deal with the right to redeem and with the rights of the various parties during a foreclosure. So next we concern ourselves with foreclosures and here the biggest set of issues and the most commonly tested issues are those dealing with notice. Suppose we've got a parcel. We'll call it Blackacre. And let's suppose that there are several different mortgages on the property, perhaps taken out by different parties, perhaps lended by different lenders or funded by different lenders. Here, what we've got to do is keep track of the parties who receive notice because if we've got a junior mortgage holder who does not get notice of the foreclosure action, that junior mortgage holder will still have a valid note. It won't be discharged by the foreclosure action. So the most commonly tested bread and butter issue with regard to foreclosures is the rights of parties who don't get notice. And typically they've got rights that will very much spoil the day of the parties who thought that they were able to resolve the issues with regard to uh, ownership by foreclosure. So I've just made reference to a junior encumbrance. This is an issue of secured transactions, which again is paramount. It's just central to the whole body of law. Oftentimes the same parcel will have multiple mortgages. And what we want is we want to be the first mortgage holder because that's the person that gets paid first. And in the event of a deficiency, the junior holders also don't get paid. Now, some states also will test secured transactions involving personal property, but every jurisdiction tests secured transactions involving real estate mortgages. So we next finally turn to a place where real property law and the law of real property conveyancing touches the law of wills and trusts. And this is the case all the way across the country. All of us are responsible for having at least some minimal understanding of how real property conveyances by will can get a little complicated. And there's three things that you need to know, three issues that arise from the law of wills and trusts that are common in real estate transactions. And my view is you're more likely to see these issues presented on an essay question about wills and trusts that involves real property than you are on a straight real property question. But that's why many of us refer to the law as a seamless web. It's all connected one way or another. So remember that the law of wills and trusts is really dealing with ownership. Here we're dealing with ownership across generations. So three issues regarding real estate that arise in the context of wills and trusts. First, ademption. Ademption. Suppose I write a will in which I convey Blackacre to an heir, but let's say that between the time that I sign my will and my death, I convey Blackacre to some other party. So although my will makes an express gift of Blackacre to a party, I no longer own Blackacre. So that gift is said to have been ademed and it fails. The taker under the will can't receive Blackacre because I no longer own it at the time of my death. So that attempt by me to convey Blackacre by will will fail because of ademption. Another issue that is very different from ademption, one that is much more favorable to those who inherit property, is exoneration. Exoneration was 
a common law principle that held that real property conveyed by will needed to be conveyed free and clear, and that personal property of the decedent would be used to render that property free and clear. The modern approach to exoneration is that we will allow real property to be conveyed by will, burdened by mortgages or other complications. Now, that is not to say that a decedent or a testator, before he becomes a decedent, a testator can well spell out in a will that he or she wants the real estate to be exonerated before it's conveyed. But no longer does it happen automatically the way that it used to. Here again, various local state laws differ widely on this point. I counsel you to be aware of your state law's position with regard to exoneration. And then the last issue from wills and trusts that can touch on real estate is the issue of lapse, and many states also have anti-lapse statutes. So if the gift of Blackacre in a will is given to uh, my child Emily, and, it, and then Emily is dead at the time that the will is read, does her estate get to take or does the gift lapse? The answer to that question is it depends, and it, what it depends on is state law. So again, I counsel you, look up the state law on this as you are engaged in practice. And that concludes a three-part analysis of real estate transactions. This is where the bulk of the points on real estate live on the multi-state bar exam. On essays, the points are spread out a lot more liberally across the various testable issues. Our final substantive video from the Law of Real Property will deal with remedies and real property. After that, we will go through our hypothetical questions together.